So I'll start out by talking about uh, the greatest movie disaster of all time. Uh, actually, a lot of you, there's some young folks in here who I'm sure don't remember anything much that happened before about 2005. But for those of us who have a few gray hairs that we're ardently trying to cover with dye, um, this was a movie, giant water movie. Giant, giant water movie. And of course, as you know, if you're a homeowner and you know what happens when like your bathroom floods, just imagine that in a like the kind of construction that you use for a movie set. So like a big wave came along and washed away $8 million worth of their set. It had to be rebuilt. It was, it went drastically over budget. And then they raised the budget and it went over budget again. It was delayed. Uh, the stars were complaining. The media is waiting to pounce, seriously waiting to pounce. Like nine months to a year before it came out, they're just chuckling with glee. They can't control it. They're all what, um, even, in fact, the people internally had started saying things like, if we could just lose $100 million. Uh, even the director who had pushed this has been like his dream project. Uh, finally, by the end, said, I just, I put it in theaters and I just, I already knew. It was going to lose a whole lot of money and my career was going to be over. Um, it debuted in Tokyo and basically no one noticed. <laughs> Everyone was talking about other little uh, mini scandals within Hollywood, um, and the media started uh, publishing articles to the effect that this was now the most expensive movie disaster of all times, which just goes to show why journalists should never be in charge of greenlighting movies, because Titanic went on to make more money than any movie in history. <laughs> and, and you guys thought I was talking about Waterworld, right? And this is the thing, is that in fact, they're a lot closer than you think. In fact, if you look at the stats, Waterworld had a lot of advantages. For one thing, it had a movie star that someone had heard of. Titanic had Leonardo DiCaprio, who was mostly renowned for playing the mentally handicapped, and Kate Winslet, who had starred in one low-budget movie that no one had ever seen. Um, the experience of filming this movie was so grueling that Kate Winslet got pneumonia, and they just had to stop production while she recovered. Um, not only that, this was the second time he had done this. Does anyone remember The Abyss? It's now a cult classic. Lost it, when it actually debuted, it lost money and didn't do as well as notable films like Uncle Buck, um, <laughs> where it was, it was substantially beaten by Uncle Buck at the box office and was so grueling that Ed Harris to this day will actually not discuss it. Um, he just like, when reporters ask him, he's like, I don't talk about that. And, threatens to punch them. Um, no, I made that last part up. Anyway, uh, but also, it, Waterworld actually made its release date. So you want to release a big blockbuster basically in the summer uh, because that's when all the teenage boys are out of school. And since teenage boys aren't allowed to drink, what they do is just go to the movies and drag everyone they know and they make their little girlfriends come with them. And so you want a big, if you have a big budget movie like that, it's supposed to come out. Biggest weekend is July 4th. Um, Waterworld made its July release date. Titanic, on the other hand, just was so badly overscheduled that they had to slip it and run it at Christmas, which is usually when you want to be running like kid, little kid movies, because that's what people do with their kids when they're home from school. Titanic picked up an audience no one had expected. Tween Girls. Tween Girls freaked, is that, I mean, people may remember this, there were like Titanic themed weddings and so forth. Like, Tween girls freaked out about this movie. They went, they went again, they got all their little friends to come, they made all the boys go, and the boys were like, ah, oh, there's kissing, and then the boat sank. They're like, ah, oh, the boat sank. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was, it's actually, you look at the box office for a normal blockbuster, and they make all of their, their, their money in like the first three weeks. People just kept going to see Titanic. They saw it like 13, 14, 15 times. This is the kind of pattern you used to see with like Star Wars. No one had predicted this. No one had seen this coming. And it was basically the biggest box office ever until James Cameron outdid himself with, with Avatar. Um, we like to think that there's a plan. We like to think that, that failure comes when you didn't prepare enough, or you were just not being smart in some way, or you're a bad person and you did something bad and that's why you failed. But if you actually look out in the marketplace, that's not what you see, right? So let, let me talk to you about a product that was really well planned. So old soft drink company, They've got a hot young competitor, not even that young, but like in the soft drink market, it's not that big. So they've got a competitor coming up on their, their back and Coke is really frightened because Pepsi is now, take the Pepsi challenge and everyone is buying Pepsi. And so they think they need to do something because they're about to lose their number one position. So they get their like brain trust in and the brain trust says, well, you know, Coca-Cola was invented in the 1890s and it tastes like an 1890s soft drink. Maybe we just need to change it. So they decide that maybe what they should do is, uh, 
replace it with a newer, sweeter, uh, without the kind of lemony undertones that new Coke, that old Coke has. So they're going to do a new Coke. And it's not entirely clear why they felt they needed to get rid of old Coke in order to do this rather than just introduce a second Coke. Uh, but they're understandably a little bit nervous about this. So they go out and they, uh, they market test. They do the biggest market research study ever done. And the results come back. They're like, you would, people love this stuff. They can't wait to get their hands on it. It's amazing. Go. And the head of the company is only says, do it again. So they go out and they do the biggest market study in history again. <laughs> they do more market research than anyone has ever done multiple times. And it all comes back saying new Coke is going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. We need but put it into stores for consumers to just rush the shelves, grab it all, and take it home with them. And it went on the market and it lasted only a matter of months and nearly just down the company with it. It's not because the people at New Coke were, at, at Coke were stupid. They're not. They're, they, you don't get to be the owner of the largest and most successful brand in the history of humanity by just being a bunch of morons who do any random thing that comes into your head. They weren't. The problem is that the question that they wanted to, that you want to ask before you go in with a new product is never the question that you can actually answer. So the question you want to ask is, when I make this product and I put it on the shelves, are people going to buy it? And are they going to keep buying it? The only question you can ask is something like the question that the new Coke market research people did, which is, if I go to a supermarket and give people a three-ounce free sample of this, will they tell me they like this better than Pepsi or Old Coke? That's not the same question. It's not even that close to the same question, but it's the best you can do. The universe is inherently an uncertain place. We like to think that we can plan our way around failure, that we can engineer it out of the system somehow. But as we just saw with the financial crisis, this is a great thing. I started as an economics reporter in 2003, and I was writing about something called the Great Moderation. <laughs> yeah, some of you, I see the laughter in the audience, right? This was the idea that the Fed was so good at its job that we were never going to have a financial crisis again. We had figured it out. We were so smart that it was now not possible. Um, oops. <laughs> like, <laughs> the, the most dangerous place you ever are is when you think that you have engineered away the possibility of failure. Because not only have you not done that, you are also not prepared for anything to go wrong. So what happened with, with Coke, they took it, what, what people hadn't realized was that the, it wasn't like, do you want to drink this or do we want to drink this in a three-on sample? And by the way, a, a sweeter drink is always just going to get more people to say, I want it if you give it to them in a free sample, unless it's actually like, you know, syrup. Um, but that's not the same as wanting to drink a whole can of it or wanting to buy a bunch. But mostly what they hadn't thought about was that people might like new Coke, but they didn't like it when it cost them the option of old Coke. And suddenly they realized they loved old Coke. Maybe they didn't want to drink it all the time, but they wanted to have it. It was, you know, it's like, you don't want to find out. You just can't go to Slovakia. Maybe you've never been. <laughs> And maybe you aren't planning a trip anytime soon, but if someone was just like, never, you can never go to Slovakia, you would be upset. Um, and so actually the interesting thing is that this turned out to be great for the company. It was great, they had done something dumb, which was they'd bet the farm, but then they did something smart, which was that they pulled this thing off the shelves, put old Coke back as quickly as they could, and it turned out that like, this actually revitalized the brand because people were reminded how much they loved old Coke. They booked their ticket to Slovakia and, and, and took that option that they'd almost lost. Um, it strikes me when I, when I read stories about entrepreneurship in magazines that all of the stories are like, genius inventor, genius, he had a genius idea, and he's been a hardworking fellow and kind of brilliant all his life, and then he just went out and did this brilliant thing, and it was brilliant, and everyone loves it and now he is standing with his arms crossed on the cover of a business magazine staring at the camera, right? Um, but then when you actually talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, that's completely not the impression that you get of how the economy works. The impression that you get is the guys who are like, yeah, so we started this company and we totally thought we were gonna do this one thing and it turned out no one wanted that, but accidentally we figured out that this other thing was really great and people loved it and now that's what we do for a living. Or we started this one thing and it was totally great and people loved it, but there was no revenue model and then we went out of business. Um, and that's what most entrepreneurs do, right? Like if you, if you take a group of people in one study, you take a group of people with, um, they've started a successful business before, they have good VC backing, which means that they're not gonna run into an imminent cash crisis. Um, and they've got a pretty sound business, and also means that they've got a pretty sound business plan. Three times out of 10, those people will succeed. Seven times out of 10, their business will flop. 
They're basically like baseball players, right? Like a great batter is a guy who fails seven out of 10 times at the plate. And that's pretty much the track record for a great entrepreneur. Most things don't work. And it isn't because people are stupid. It's because the universe is uncertain. A realistic model of the universe is the universe. Anything smaller than that, you've got to have some simplifying assumptions. And you don't know if your simplifying assumptions are wrong. There's just no way to get around that. And so what is actually the way to entrepreneurial success, to economic success? It's iteration and experimentation. There's a great guy who's the head of user experience for Palm. He goes and does this test with uh, a bunch of different groups of people. 25 strands of spaghetti and a roll of tape make me the tallest structure that's capable of supporting an egg. Now, a lot of you have probably done some sort of team building exercise similar to this, but he wasn't interested in like whether people bonded and wore t-shirts and screamed the company cheer at the end of the day. He was interested in how they, who did better and why. So some of the people are what you would expect. Singaporean engineers do very well on this challenge. Uh, some of the people who don't do well are also who you would uh, uh, suspect. MBAs are like absolutely the worst. <laughs> Apparently they spend all, we spend all of our time uh, arguing about who's going to be like in charge of writing the vision statement for Team Spaghetti. And, and don't laugh because lawyers don't do well either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but here, the most successful group is not Singaporean engineers. It is kindergartners. And like you look at these things, the things the engineers build, it's like the Eiffel Tower. The things that the, the Singaporean engineer, the little kids build, it's like, right? Totally, they look like what happens when you give a team of kindergartners some spaghetti and some tape. Uh, so how did they succeed? Iteration and experimentation. So first of all, they're five, so they don't know there are any rules. They're the only group that asked for more spaghetti. <laughs> and with that, but what they did with the spaghetti is what's really powerful. They just started experimenting. And they ruthlessly called what didn't work, right? If it didn't work, they threw it away and started over. Take that piece off. That, didn't, that made things worse, not better. And with that process of what Silicon Valley calls failing fast, <laughs> they actually got the best result. That is how evolution works. It's how the economy works. And it's frankly how most learning works. If you think about how you learn to play tennis, right? You don't learn to play tennis by developing an elaborate theory of tennis ball physics. If that were true, then like every year Wimbledon, right, would be won by some guy from MIT who is the world's best fast physicist. But that's not the case. You learn to play tennis by hitting the ball, and most of the time it doesn't do what you think it will, right? But then a couple of times, it sort of goes in the right direction. And over time, your brain learns from doing that, those rare things, that's how I should hit the ball. And you do it over and over and over. It's also how we learn to do math, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Those five ways I tried to do algebra didn't work. Apparently, this one way the teacher told me about. Um, but in fact, like, why do you learn from doing problem sets over and over and over again? Because it's that repetition and trying things that don't work and calling the many, many, many ways there are to do things wrong. There's a story about Thomas Edison, which may be apocryphal, but it's a great story, that after he had spent years mucking around with light bulb filaments, trying everything from bamboo to cotton to, and getting nowhere, uh, that someone asked him, so how does it feel to have failed? He said, what do you mean failed? I know 10,000 things that do not make good filaments for incandescent light bulbs. And we laugh, and a lot of his contemporaries and later critics have said, well, if he'd had more theory and less like brute force, he would have been a better inventor. Except Thomas Edison was an amazing inventor, right? Like this guy had an amazing number of patents, and yes, there were lots of people working in his lab, but they were basically using this brute force, try, fail, try, fail, try, fail technique. Libertarians are good at this, right? This is actually, libertarians are good at letting things fail. We like letting things fail. We get happy when a company lets, when the government lets a company go bankrupt, right? Um, one thing I think we could spend a little more time talking about is what happens afterwards, though. Not like we're bad on this, but it actually matters a lot. It's not just enough to say, like, mama bird is throwing you out of the nest. Fly, right? If it plummets, you don't just leave it there and wait for a wolf to eat it. Um, something has to happen to allow people to recover from failure. And this matters for two, two reasons. Um, the first reason is that if it, failure is really costly, people won't do it. Right? If getting fired meant that you automatically lost your house and all your friends and they took your children away, then probably you would be really, really conservative in your work and spend all of your time thinking about how not to get fired instead of maybe how to create value for the company. Um, also matters because when, you, when things fail badly, you tie up the most precious thing we have, which is human capital. You think about the number of hours and the amount of money 
that, your, that our parents invested in each of us. It's a phenomenal investment. Each of us represents an incredible investment of technology and effort and financial capital just to get us to the point where we're reasonable adults capable of functioning in the modern world. Every time that someone fails badly, we take all of that human capital and we throw it away. So it's really, really important to think about how do we recover lost human capital from a failure? And America's often very good at this. You talk to European executives about what happens to them when they work for a company that goes, if, if they say go off and start a business that fails, and they say, I can't do that because who would want to hire me? You talk to, I was just talking to the CFO of a company that went under in 2000, and he was like, I was really worried that that would happen because he'd never been in the startup world before. It was just kind of random, ended up as the CFO, and then it went badly and he didn't have a job anymore. And he went out and people were like, this is great. You learned on someone else's dime. You have a lot of valuable information. And failure is, because as I say, failure is how we learn. Failure is a lot of valuable information. And America's really good at this in the business world. We're not so good at this with the prison system. We're much worse than Europe or almost anywhere else with the way that we have taken two million young men and basically made them unemployable um, and wrecked their lives. I mean, I'm not saying that like, they didn't do anything wrong. Most of the people in prison have done things that they shouldn't have done. Um, but it's still a phenomenal waste both of, I mean, it's a phenomenal waste for them because each human being is incredibly precious. It's also a phenomenal waste for society because those are all people who could be contributing and aren't. Um, so like, I'll close by saying that we want to think about how, how, we, how we let things fail, how we, how we help people pick themselves up afterwards. Um, and I have an entire chapter in the book dedicated to what I think is actually the unsung hero of the American economy, which is bankruptcy. Because we're really good at this with the bankruptcy system. The American bankruptcy system is really unique. Um, and most people don't realize this, is that the American bankruptcy system is by far the most generous in the entire world, both on the corporate side and on the personal side. It's so, it's so generous that in the, when I was covering our draconian 2005 bankruptcy reform, which I opposed, but not for the, the normal reasons of, um, when I was covering it for The Economist, I was trying to describe what the new law said. My colleagues were like, well, of course you have to reform that. That's outrageously lax. And I was like, no, this is the draconian new law. The old one was even easier. The idea that you can just walk into a judge and be like, I brought a bunch of money. I don't have it. And the judge is like, OK, well. Too bad, debt discharged, like that's crazy to people. I was interviewing a guy for a completely different section of the book, a Russia expert. He's Scandinavian and he just randomly started making fun of the American bankruptcy system in the middle of the interview um, and how ridiculous it is. You just walk in and be like, judge, I don't have any money and judge is like, okay, that's too bad. Bye-bye uh, creditors, bye-bye debt. That seems crazy to people. And yet, if you actually look at research, what you see is that states, because uh, in America we vary by state and how much m money you can shield from creditors, states that have more lax, more generous exemptions have more entrepreneurship. It matters a lot how we help people pick themselves up. So how do we think about Failure shouldn't not hurt. And that's the kind of the mistake that a lot of European unemployment systems have made, for example, right? The idea that failure should just not be painful. And so what you see in those systems is that people will spend 10 years trying to be a steel worker in a region where there's no longer any steel foundries. And they're just kind of waiting until someone opens a steel foundry because they don't want to go out and do the brutal and unpleasant work of finding another job doing something else, especially if they're 50 years old and have a lot of capital accumulated in that. You're enabling people to make a rational short-term decision because I've been unemployed long-term and it's really terrible. And job search is the worst part of that. It feels awful to go out and be like, hey, want to reject me? And people are like, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it shouldn't not hurt because the pain is nature's way of saying, don't do that. <laughs> that doesn't work. Stop. Uh, if it didn't hurt, we wouldn't stop. But you don't want the pain to be crippling the way that, say, a felony sentence now is for people where once they get out, they're pretty much unemployable and they might as well go back to being criminals because their alternative is maybe a, a minimum wage job. And when you look at like the success stories that come out of prison now, a distressingly high percentage of them, as far as I can tell, nearly all of them are people who are working like in a prison rehabilitation thing. You're not seeing people actually transition from, I committed a felony when I was 24 to now I'm a successful something. And there's a lot of professions that won't let them in at all. Um, that's a problem. So how, how should the pain look? It should look short. It should be short. 
It should not drag on for years. It should be sharp because it should hurt, even if it's not your fault. Unemployment should be unpleasant, not because you were necessarily did something wrong to be unemployed to, in getting unemployed. Lots of people are laid off because their company is doing badly. It should be unpleasant because otherwise people won't try to leave it. And in the long run, you look at studies, being unemployed is just miserable. It's miserable in Scandinavia. It's miserable in Germany. It's not miserable because of the financial privation. It's miserable because it deprives you of an important place in society. Um, it should be in the context of a relationship that, you know, you're a member of society. We want to restore you to society if that's at all possible. I mean, if you're a crazy serial killer who cannot be allowed out, that's one thing. But that describes such a, I mean, you know, it's not even worth making public policy about, right? That's like 100 people in the country. Um, and it should encourage you to move on. It should be about the future and not about the past. 